the Jersey Shore after Labor Day. Having grown up here, it's always been kind of bittersweet. As a kid, it marked the end of mini golf and the beginning of gym class. As a grown up, it marks the end of, well, I'm, well, still mini golf. I mean, I still play mini golf because the kids love that shit. But anyway, while the youngsters might be sad that the sand toys are about to take a long winter nap, inshore anglers along the entire Northeast coast are dusting off their bright orange foul weather gear, getting pumped for the pending cold weather striper season. Now, I've been chasing those fish my whole life, and I love them dearly, but I'm not in a huge rush to get to them. Not when the final throws of summer offer a Florida Key-style fishery right here in Jersey that many locals don't even know about. I'm Joe Cermelli. This is Fishing on the B-Side. Well before dawn breaks, I meet up with my old fishing partner, Captain Eric Kerber. We're like brothers, really, and for almost 20 years now, Kerbs and I have beat up on all kinds of fish in all kinds of places, but he pays the bills living that Jersey salt life. Oh, also, under the romantic glow of the marina lights, Kerbs introduces me to his new mate, Chris Stewart, who I've never met before today, but just based on his looks, I can tell dude likes to party. You ever seen Point Break? I did. <laughs> Okay. Great movie. Just asking. <laughs> what do I look like? <laughs> Zero dark 30. We got a long way to go. The forecast is calling for calm conditions, which will get more and more rare as September presses on. So lucky for us because we're making a mid-shore run of about 30 miles in search of mahi-mahi, more commonly referred to as dolphin. Mahi is a species more associated with Florida and the Caribbean but come late summer as the Gulf Stream hurls clean, warm blue water north, with it comes piles and piles of these fish. Mahi love shade-producing surface structure, and down south, anglers that get after them target floating weed mats or oil rigs. We don't have any of that stuff here, but what we do have are endless fields of lobster pot markers, and their bobbing buoys draw in mahis like a magnet. First pot is the coolest pot. Without doubt. It's the anticipation. Is the first pot gonna be holding? Yeah. And then this is like a video game all day. We're just gonna bounce around and some will have none, some will have 30 chickens. Are they gonna be there or are they not gonna be there? You know? And first then, and then what, curse, and you then want what, it, but you don't. They, <laughs> you know? And then what will they eat? Everything, Good. damn it, today. So maybe they didn't want to commit to a popper, but the massive school of mahi on that very first pot gave themselves away instantly. Quick switch to a jig and... Pile of them down there. So, we just had him chasing after some poppers. This one ate a jig. Can we go back and mop them all up with chunks? We're about to find out. Mahi are schooling fish, and usually they pounce on the first jig or topwater that lands in their zone. Eventually, though, the little bastards wise up. But if you've got a flat of sardines, and in our case, we do, well, suddenly they're not wise at all. In fact, they're downright stupid, and that's when the real chaos ensues. That's a better one. Ooh, that's a uh, better one. Fire! Absolute fire. Absolute fire. This could be kind of a ridiculous day, Kerber. Get them worked up and chow in chunks, and they'll move right off the pot and stay right behind the boat. And before you know it, it's gaffs flying everywhere and the deck is covered in blood. 
So, how much Mahi blood is okay to spill? Well, that's a question I'll answer in today's installment of Talking Shit. The shit that we're gonna talk about today is why mahi might just be the perfect species for anglers that love bloody decks and full coolers. Mahi can be found in every temperate ocean in the world and they are one of the fastest growing fish on the planet. Now, for science and shit, mahi can live to be five years old but rarely live longer than four years, which means that the 87 pound world record mahi caught in 1976 grew to those proportions in a very short amount of time. Their slender bodies, forked tails, and curved pectoral fins are all designed for speed. And mahis have been known to hit speeds of 57 miles per hour when they really step on the gas. All of these tools are necessary because to maintain that growth rate, mahi have to eat a lot, which means they'll snap up pretty much any live bait, cut bait, popper, jig, plug, or fly that lands in front of them. Hell, I even knew a dude once who swore by hollow body frogs designed for largemouth fishing. Mahi are also one of the most abundant pelagic species on the planet, and both males and females are mature enough to have freaky dolphin sex at a mere four months old. They reproduce year round, females can spawn up to three times a year, and they'll produce 80 to 100,000 eggs per spawn. Best of all, mahi harvests are generally considered sustainable, particularly in U.S. water, which means high bag limits and in many states, no size limit. Point being, given that these fish live fast and die young, putting a big mahi in the box doesn't carry the same guilt some anglers may feel when, say, putting a 50-pound striper in the box that took 35 years to get that big. Likewise, while I'd never advocate taking more of any species than you can consume, nobody should feel bad about throwing some small mahis in the cooler because there's plenty of them out there and there's more being made all the time. So enjoy those fish tacos. But if you can't even wait to get home to start eating your mahi, try this shit. So what we're gonna do here as a little treat we're gonna take the smallest mahi out of the batch we've already put in the cooler. Kerber here is gonna slice it up real nice. We're gonna make a little ceviche out here that we can enjoy later back at the dock. Ceviche is a simple and ancient raw fish preparation that requires little more than a big Ziploc bag and a few ingredients you can easily prep the night before and toss in a cooler. These include shitload, hot sauce, salt, red onion, Jalapeno peppers, tomato, just a touch. Secret ingredient, pay attention to DJ fans. Watermelon, lime juice, freshly squozen. Squoze it myself. We're just gonna let that chill out in the cooler and uh, that's gonna be real nice around sunset while we're cutting up all these mahi at the dock. Now, while all that fish and picante veg marinates, letting the acid and the lime juice sort of cook it all together, we continue hopping. Each marker buoy creates shade, which attracts bait fish and other southern visitors like these Almaco jacks, offering them some sense of security. What it's really doing is creating a mini food chain. The markers are like the Quickie Mart, and the dolphin like to window shop for snacks around them, but they're certainly not shopping at every store. And as morning turns to afternoon, fish get fewer and further between for us. Next. <laughs> we add a few more chickens to the box, and Kerber keeps pinballing us from marker to marker, knowing that the next one could be the money. Also, fun side note, when the lobster guys pull their pots, they clean the markers. So we keep a particularly sharp eye out for dirty, algae-covered pot markers, because it means they've been sitting there longer, which usually means a better shot of them holding mahi. Ooh, we got a dirty one up Ooh, here. Ooh, dirty, you like dirty that, pots. don't you? <laughs> That's the only thing I want, dirty pots. As far as I know, Kerber is the only captain in Jersey that offers and promotes dedicated mahi trips. And when you consider how many years he's put in logging data, figuring out which fields are likeliest to be holding based on water temps and conditions and so on, yeah, dude gets a little testy when someone kerns in on the string he's working. You got a whole pot field, this asshole's gotta come right in on the pot next to it. <laughs> Thought the weekend was over. It's all good though, man, because there really are plenty of pots out there for everyone. 
And just when we think we're destined to close out with onesie twosie chicken pecs, we find one more late day bobber loaded down with some bigger players. You can catch them on the clean pots. You're that good. Yeah, baby. Kerber's saying this one's got enough ass that he's going to fire up the motors. Jason does something crazy like go on there and we got to circle him like a tuna fish. Mahi are made for light tackle. Unfortunately, too many are caught as bycatch while trolling with broomsticks for bigger targets like tuna and marlin. Put a 15-pound mahi on a 50-wide trolling setup, and you'll hurt yourself more fighting that heavy gear than the fish. Pit that same fish against a light spinning outfit, one that maybe is even on the cusp of being a hair too light, and suddenly that fish is ripping line as it heads to the bottom instead of skating across the surface in the prop wash. That is a really nice bull. Jersey style, bro. Where you at? <laughs> My man. We've been doing this together for years. And with that bull, the box is full enough for us. So Kerber points the bow west, and we head home happy. I mean, how could we not? We just spent the whole morning catching mahi in Jersey. I think it was Ralph Macchio's character in The Outsiders that famously said, nothing gold can stay. I'll, I'll check on that, but regardless, it's, it's true of mahi season and summer. Quite often, a mahi run serves as my last blue water trip before the gales of fall keep us close to the beach. What I will say though, is that if this was our swan song in shorts and flip flops, we went out with one hell of a bang, man. Honestly, man, in all the years that we've been mahi fishing together, I think in terms of numbers of big fish on one pot, that was the best I ever seen it. That was the best the one. The first pot was the that, best I've ever seen it. That was the best one pot we've had, no question. With our day's haul tagged and bagged, it was time to keep up with tradition. That being that every trip with Kerber must end at the 10th Avenue Burrito Company. Like, it's his favorite place in the world and it just has to happen. And this certainly won't be the first time I've dined there in bloodstained clothes. A little bit of blood splatter. It's all right. They're cool. It's all right. Yeah. It also won't be the last time I explore the underground overlooked fisheries in my very crowded, often misunderstood home state of New Jersey. Now today, we got a taste of South Florida right here in the armpit of the nation. Had this been South Florida, of course, we'd be closing out with 10th Ave fixing us a sizzling plate of mahi tacos, but... Even though it kind of looked like Key West today here, it's not. And cook your catch is illegal here in New Jersey. So, quesadilla.